Okay, welcome back. Um, our next speaker is the British Liberal Democrat MP, John Hemming, who uh, has just revealed to me that he is uh, that he has in his life been a, a Sex Pistols fan. Uh, uh, <laughs> he used to play Sex Pistols. He, well, there you go. Yeah, a heavy, a heavy metal drummer in his day. Yeah, now he's he, he, he tends to play uh, sort of more traditional jazz standards. He's an interesting guy, a very prominent guy in the UK. Um, he's uh, achieved just about the sort of the, the, a, a great thing in the British media context that the British media often describe him or tend very, very often to describe him as a maverick. That, in my view, is a, is a recommendation. That means that he's somebody who is prone to speak his mind, prone to sort of go against the grain and break the consensus. Uh, what he's going to be talking about today is... Uh, narrow rights of the freedom of expression and it's all linked to as i said earlier secret courts and the rule of law yeah okay john issues um i all of the all of the work that other people have focused on is is the wider broadcasting media where you're publishing things to a substantial number of people i'm actually interested also i'm interested in that but i won't talk very much about it because i could go on forever uh, I'm also interested in narrow rights of freedom of expression. Uh, what constraints are there in any one country? And obviously I'm focusing on England uh, and a bit in Scotland. What constraints are there on people talking to each other, taking advice, complaining about things? So who, who, who can you talk to and who can you not talk to? Who can you complain to? And who can you petition? Petition being the traditional word for raising a complaint. Uh, the right to whinge. Is there a right to whinge? Well, in America, we have the First Amendment to the US Constitution. The, the interesting part about abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, which was in the First Amendment, is one thing which... I, it changes the law on defamation, for instance, in, into Ameri in America, where the burden is on the person being defamed to prove what's being said about them is not true, rather than the burden being to, for the people who wrote something to prove that it is true. And that's quite an interesting thing. Um, but the one I'm particularly interested in here is the petition of the government for a redress of grievances. And from the point of view of the three estates of the state, viz. The, the parliament, the senate, the house of representatives, uh, the government, the president, and the judiciary, that's been interpreted that people have a right to complain about things in America. In theory, uh, for those who, who don't know, the, the basic fundamental constitutional law of the United Kingdom is the Bill of Rights, uh, which was initially English and Welsh. Um, there are two um, articles that are crucial to this. One is Article 5, which I'm one of the few people who talk about Article 5. Article 9 is the interesting thing from the media point of view, because that's, that creates this jurisdiction whereby the courts can't look at what's said in Parliament. And that doesn't mean you have complete freedom of speech in Parliament, because Parliament can control what you say. The, obviously, the, the meetings that go on are chaired by somebody, so um, they can set, tell you to shut up, as I have been at times. I don't know if people have watched the videos. Um, but, but, the, but not, so nine's interesting. I highlight that one as well, and there's the other things there, but five, to me, is the interesting one here. And I, I'm, I'm going to look at a number of individual cases because that shows the sort of things which I think are going wrong in England that shouldn't. Um, so let's look at what sort of restrictions there can be on the freedom of expression. Court orders, where the court can say, you mustn't talk to people about this or you mustn't talk to a particular person about it. That one I'm going to spend some time on. Statute, obviously, there are still official secrets in England, and if you tell people official secrets, you can, in fact, um, be um, convicted of, of a criminal offence. Defamation, again, defamation tends in the UK to, to be civil, um, not part of the criminal code, Copyright is an interesting um, restriction on freedom of expression. Obviously, I, I support the existence of copyright. One thing a lot of people don't know is that roughly half, maybe 60% of all court judgments that are public are not published. That is, they are the copyright of the judgments in the English courts is held by the copyright writers, the shorthand writers. And I think that's part of funding the courts. But there is a website called the British and Irish, Irish Legal Institute, Bailey, um, which has published judgments on it. But those 
which are copyrighted don't appear there because they're copyrighted and the shorthand writers want to be paid for them, so you have to pay them like 25 pounds of judgment. What that means is somebody who doesn't do this all the time, who's just wanting to investigate the law, can't do it. And we were talking earlier about the accession treaty, like Croatia is being required to make sure all their judgments are published, but the UK doesn't do that well. The England and Wales doesn't do it, and they're all, about half of them or so are copyrighted and not on Bailey. And there's an interesting one about contempt of Parliament, that the Parliament can control freedom of expression. There was a legal firm who threatened me um, with a... Um, to sue me if I didn't say, if I um, didn't agree not to say something in Parliament. And that expression of a threat um, was found to be contempt of Parliament. And then we look at the sanctions, and sanctions are actually quite important because sanctions affect people's willingness to take a risk. Because often in a situation, you may have something where you think you've got all the evidence, but you're not too sure. And it's a question of what the risk is. Um, damages is always, if there's a million pound on a libel suit, 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 then that's quite important. But damage isn't, isn't the only thing. In the UK, legal costs, and the, you have the costs following the action. So, in other words, um, when you lose, you may have to pay the other side's costs. And they can end up to be like hundreds of thousands of pounds. And if you look at what's going on, some of the stuff the independent's been doing on the Court of Protection, trying to challenge the secrecy there, is very expensive. Um, Partly as a result of the media, partly, part, partly as a result of the internet, rather. Uh, the media haven't got so much money these days because lots of media organizations are not bringing in the advertising money. It's going to Google instead. Um, so these costs actually are quite important. And the European Court of Human Rights did find that the success fees of a conditional fee arrangement um, are sufficient to actually have a chilling effect on the media. Because um, if we look at imprisonment, for instance, the editor might be willing to take the, ch the chance of losing some money in a libel case, but the editor probably wouldn't want to take the chance of going to jail. And so when you have something where there is a risk of going to jail, um, people are a bit more cautious than perhaps where it's going to cost them 50 grand potentially or settle something like that. So the, 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 the threat of imprisonment does have quite a big effect. Obviously, there's uncertainties of prosecution. You don't know whether you're going to be prosecuted, you don't know what's going to happen. And there's uncertainties of jurisdiction. So, for instance, I'm sitting here. Now, what, one interesting thing is you have, for instance, uh, there was a television program on the Belgian telly um, that is injuncted in the UK. <laughs> so, in other words, YouTube, if you try and look at it on YouTube from the UK, you can't. All right? Um, and I'm here in outside the UK jurisdiction. Potent in theory, I'm not subject to... Um, the uh, need to keep some of the things secret that I'm going to keep secret um, because I'm outside the UK. But I don't want to take the chance because I've got to go back there. Now, if I was living in Berlin, I could say a lot more because I'm not going back to the UK. But because I'm going back to the UK, there are certain things I'm not going to say. And some things will be anonymous later that wouldn't be anonymous uh, if I lived here. Um, so you have this uncertainty of jurisdiction. It's, you don't want to take the chance. You know, I've, I've got, I, I have the ability, obviously, to say things in Parliament. So if I, within the constraints of the parliamentary rules, like sub judice, I can main, name things in Parliament. But, and there are privileges. Parliamentary privilege, we looked at that earlier. What it, parliamentary privilege means is the courts can't look at Parliament's, what's said in Parliament. Then there's qualified privilege and absolute privilege. Um, absolute privilege applies to things like court hearings, so if they're repeat reported by the media, you can't be sued on that. And then the fair use privilege for copyright, so you can make some use. So there are protections that exist, but going back to the issue earlier, costs. People don't want to take a chance, and the costs and the risks are the things that have the chilling effect, as was talked about earlier. Now we'll look at a few cases. Uh, Bradford versus Hempel. This one was published in the Sunday Times. Um, where it was, it was revealed in the Sunday Times that there was a substance called acrylonitrile, which is a mild carcinogen in the drinking water of passenger ships, cruise ships. Right? You can look the story up in the Sunday Times from last year. Um, somebody discovered there was something going wrong with the water, and he was injuncted. And he was, one of the things he was prevented from doing, Brian Bradford's his name, one of the things he was prevented from doing was telling the US Coast Guard. So um, in terms of the right to whinge, he knew there was something wrong with the water, but he was banned from telling the Coast Guard. I think that's wrong. Um, Bromer Ganwi is a hospital trust. Karashi is a doctor. He thought another doctor was spectacularly bad at operating on patients and had killed some of them. Uh, but they've got an injunction, and it's published actually more recently on Bailey under the Queen's Bench, 2012, February. Look up the spelling. You'll see it there. Um, basically, he's not allowed 
to tell the police without getting permission from the patient's relatives, the patients that have died. Uh, but he's not allowed to use the information that's confidential to the hospital to contact the relatives of the patients. So he's in a catch-22 situation where he can't report what he thinks is a crime. Now, it may be a crime, it may not be a crime. To me, it's up to the police to decide whether it's worth investigating, not for the hospital to spend around about £300,000, which is what they've spent, and they're trying to get the money off him, um, to stop him reporting a crime. And as I said, it's this catch-22. If you read the judgment, it's, it's an interesting thing to read. Vicky Haig was a mother who came to a meeting in Parliament, which I chaired, and she asked a question of Anthony Douglas, the head of CAFCAS. And then, about a week or two later, Doncaster Metropolitan District tried to imprison her. For They applied to the court to imprison her, and a, a lady called Elizabeth Watson. Um, Vicky Haig has since been imprisoned for three years, in my view, to shut her up, uh, but for a different reason. She wasn't actually imprisoned at that time for asking a question at a meeting in Parliament. Um, Elizabeth Watson was sort of helping Vicky Haig, but, you know, sometimes people help people in a way that is really count completely counterproductive. And Elizabeth Watson was one of those people who did something, really, my advice to her was to stop doing what she was doing because she would be likely to go to jail. And lo and behold, she was sentenced to nine months imprisonment, I think about October, something like September. Um, but she apologized. This is for talking about things and complaining about Vicky Hayes' case, which is a very, very complex case. Very, very complex. I'm not going to go into it. Um, and so she was released after about two or three weeks um, because she apologized. Um, Fred Goodwin, everyone probably knows about that one. People in England definitely know about that one. He got an injunction to pro which had the effect, not with the objective of, but had the effect of preventing information being passed to the Financial Services Authority, which was relevant to their inquiry into activities at RBS, the question as to whether he'd followed the internal code of RBS. And the FSA accepted that um, this was information relevant to um, their, their investigation. The judge said, well, if you'd applied to the court for permission to send the information to the FSA, I would have given permission. Well, that's no good, because there's costs again. And the uncertainty, you can't be quite sure what's going to happen. The costs, 10, 20 grand to get a complaint to the FSA. That's not reasonable. Um, there's a very interesting, this, is, this, this one hasn't been in the public domain, the one at the bottom here, which is a public interest immunity certificate, which has been obtained by the civil service, where there are allegations and evidence relating to whether there's been bribery and things like that uh, involving Department of Transport officials. There's, there's a discussion about that, and there was a criminal case, and there's a PII cert that's come out. Um, that hasn't hit the media yet. Um, I'm worried about a PII cert being used to stop investigation of bribery. We don't know whether it did happen or not. We, we, we're not sure. Uh, but, but we know there's a PII certificate preventing further investigation. Now, this, this is slightly linked. This is a banner on a bridge in Birmingham at the Lib Dem conference. I'm a Lib Dem. And this was protesting basically against me. All right? And they put this banner up here, and the police, this, this is a bridge between the Hyatt Hotel over there and the ICC here. And the police arrested them for putting the banner, because they shouldn't have put the banner there. But then, um, they started to prosecute them for putting the banner there. Um, now, there were three people involved. Ed Bauer was already on bail for something he'd done, I think at Fortnum and Mason. So they wouldn't release him. So he, I found out about this about sort of a week later, and I went to the bail hearing and said, you know, I argued, because I was a witness to this, I saw the, pit, the thing being put up. I argued um, that he should be released on bail, and they released him on bail. Um, and then the, about two weeks ago, um, the, trail, the, the trial of prosecuting them for, for the risky activity of putting a banner on a bridge um, actually fell apart. But it still remains that somebody had been imprisoned for 10 days for putting up a banner. And you have this question of, you, know, you have a thing called institutional momentum where people make a mistake and then rather than correcting the mistake, they compound the mistake. So the mistake was having got them to take the banner down to try and do anything else because they shouldn't have put the banner there because they didn't have permission. But the, it, it comes to a constraint on the freedom of expression, protesting expression in this instance, that you're saying you can't put a banner up. Um, and I think there's a great danger that when sort of people accept those sorts, you, you get a sort of movement in that direction that, that you accept um, constraints on freedom of expression, 
And this is a, a constraint on the freedom of expression to be rude about me, that I, I'm, I'm not accepting that constraint. They have a right to be rude about me. Um, this one, the Asian royal family, has been an interesting saga for anyone who's watched things appearing and disappearing on website this week. Um, last Friday, um, Parliament published um, a document, which you can all find. And it was, a lot of this was reported in the Telegraph. Um, and it's a very complex saga. But again, it's one of those where there are restrictions on who's allowed to talk to whom about what, which has been overcome by parliamentary privilege. Um, a very interesting case on Monday in, in uh, England was one where they tried, they, a local authority applied to imprison her, their, a mother for, because their ch her children, who are teenagers, spoke to each other on Facebook. All right? Now, it's absurd. That one was reported by Christopher Booker in the Sunday um, Telegraph. Uh, it's been adjourned to April, so they haven't actually imprisoned her. Um, there is another issue about secret prisoners. The reason I mention Hamilton v. Hamilton is you can look that case up and you will see that a Mr. Hamilton was imprisoned with reporting restrictions, meaning that you can't publish the fact that he was imprisoned or why he was imprisoned. Uh, there was an appeal which said um, that, in fact, that shouldn't happen and we should say why he was imprisoned. But the appeal was after, was after he was released. And we, I know of another person who I think is a secret prisoner. Again, one of the difficulties here is even finding out whether there are reporting restrictions. So you get this difficulty that I don't want to name the secret prisoner outside parliamentary proceedings because I don't know whether there are reporting restrictions and I really don't want to face a big row somebody trying to jail me for saying somebody's name. So you, you get into this sort of difficulty, but this... There's, there's a, another mother, these are all about care proceedings where there's dreadful things go on in the secret courts in England. Uh, and th this, those two there, I think, are particularly dreadful. FVG is, is an interesting one, which is an employment tribunal case still going on in England where F is a woman and G is a college. And the college required her to provide services of a sexual nature to one of the students at the college who had learning difficulties. Um, now, in the interests of the privacy, yes, I know, it's only mild sexual services, but they, the Employment Tribunal has found against the college and awarded her damages for being forced to provide services of a sexual nature. It has not been reported primarily because there are reporting restrictions, right? So I can't, I know who they are, but I, and it's this business, if I was living in, in Berlin, I'd tell you who they are, but I'm not living in Berlin, I've got to go back. <laughs> so I can't tell you who they are. Um, but there are reporting restrictions on which are to protect the recipient of the sexual services. My concern about a situation like that, and you can look at these ones, you go back to the, what, what the Bromaganwi one, and the, the one at the top protects the management of the cruise ships where they didn't tell people that the water was poisoned, right? The Bromaganwi one pre protects the management at the hospital where they allowed somebody to operate who wasn't adequately trained. And the FVG one protects the management at G from anyone knowing that they have forced one of their members of staff to provide services of a sexual nature, all right? So it's protecting the management from their misdeeds and people knowing about their misdeeds. Robert Green was recently imprisoned on a Friday, I think it was about three weeks ago, for a year. Now, he has been campaigning for some time on a case relating to a girl called Holly Green, which you can look up on the internet. Now, I've looked at some of the details. Some of the allegations they make are clearly not true. Um, but he was, as f but the pr the, one of my problems is I need to see the paperwork to see what's actually going on in these cases. And a lot of these ones, I get the paperwork on. I haven't managed to get the paperwork here. But he's effectively been imprisoned for a year for going to Aberdeen South, where he was a parliamentary candidate in the general election and campaigning. Admittedly, he was campaigning for the party, I think, Scotland against crooked lawyers or something like that. Um, it did make him popular with the lawyers. But, but you see, this is where you come to think, he, he may be right, he may be wrong. But I don't think he should be imprisoned for a year for being wrong. And if he's right, he definitely shouldn't be imprisoned for a year. <laughs> Traffic Euro, not a case I've been heavily involved, but interestingly, um, the judgment on that one has copyright. So it's not a published judgment, but it's a public judgment. So it's one of those strange judgments. I have a copy of it. Um, and yes, lo and behold, Traffic Euro, the company was polluting wherever they were, have a right to privacy under Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. So we look at privacy and how it's used to shut people up. Well, actually, that's not Robert Greene, because that's a different one, but the rest of these are all about privacy, and it's the abuse 
you know, it, it's always people with lots of money, be they the public sector or private sector, abusing other people. Um, so what are we talking? Enforcement against Twitter. What was the interesting one? And a wealthy man instruct his lawyers to work to imprison people who've been joking about him. Name, name the wealthy man. Go on, who's going to name the wealthy man? No. Anyone? No? Giggs? Ryan Giggs? Anyone know about him? How he prosecuted Twitter? Yeah? And so we have a wealthy man who says, it's like Lay's Majesty in Thailand. We did it. Clive Myrie told us the story uh, on the very first day on Tuesday, the story of Ryan Giggs, who was a British football player. Yeah. Yeah, but it got to the stage where people were joking on Twitter about him. Yeah. He applied to get the IP addresses of the people on Twitter. There were actually 75,000 people had mentioned his name on Twitter. I, I, I did an estimate. Well, I know, I, I, I raised in Parliament the question as to how you could imprison 75,000 people, and then I was shut up. <laughs> just before I was going to break another injunction. But in fact, the, the law of confidence applies to most of these things in England. Things are either confidential or they're not. Um, I estimate on the basis of opinion polls, before I mention his name in Parliament, that between 24 million and 33 million people in England, which has a population of 50 million, um, were aware of his name. Now, there's two interesting points about that. That's without, with, it was in the Scottish Sunday Herald. And what happened with the Sunday Herald was interesting. They published it on the Sunday with a picture, right, outside the jurisdiction, because Scotland has a different jurisdiction to England and Wales. England and Wales is the same jurisdiction. Um, I did check, and they didn't send the newspaper to England. <laughs> but then you go back to the spy catcher case, which was in the 1980s, where it was concluded that once something is in the public domain and published, it's published, it's not secret. And what was really interesting from a media point of view about the Ryan Giggs case is actually that we got to a, a stage of penetration in terms of the number of people who knew his name, of 24 million, masses of, you know, Shillings, who his lawyers, did a marvelous PR job of getting his name into the majority of people's brains without it going in a single UK newspaper, English newspaper. So merely by things going on Twitter and being chanted at football matches, which is what was going on, it actually got to the majority of citizens. Which, which, in a sense, that demonstrates to you how the media, in a general sense, and the sort of the internet's having an effect on things. Because obviously, a lot of people got that information via the internet. And we, we look at the other wealthy man who took out an injunction which prevent that was that's Fred Goodwin, of course, where we've got the same processes going on. So um, what you have, all of these things happen in secret courts or courts with reporting restrictions, or as the judges like to prefer, they're not secret, they're private. Now, I've not worked out the difference, <laughs> but the judges say they're private, I say they're secret, private, whatever, it's the same thing. Now, there is, a, there is an issue which is um, how reliable are secret courts? We, we've already identified that they undermine the rule of law by having court orders that stop people reporting things to the police, the Coast Guard, the FSA, whoever it may be the right to whinge, you know, the, the right to petition, because all of these are arms of the state, and in, in America, that right would be properly protected. Uh, in England, you go to jail for complaining. And the Brian Bradford one was an interesting one, another aspect, that he, he, he was not allowed to talk to solicitors about it unless he'd instructed them, but to instruct them, he had to pay them, and he didn't have any money. And he therefore couldn't discuss with people on a no-win, no-fee basis getting advice. And I think he got a suspended sentence for talking to a no-win, no-fee lawyer about his case. All right? Now, that's what he told me anyway, um, which I think is very bad because, again, if you can't get advice, it's this really tight constriction on who people can take advice from and who they can talk to about cases, and I think that's dreadful. Um, but what, one of the things you've got to look at with, with secret courts is how reliable are they because perjury goes undetected. So it, we look at the issue, again, of Ryan Giggs. The judge gave an injunction because Imogen Thomas was... Um, according to the judge, blackmailing him. But everyone accepted later that she wasn't. So the injunction shouldn't have been given. So we end up in this situation where whatever's happened in that case, and I know, but I can't tell you, because um, <laughs> I have court papers, you see. Um, but, but whatever's happened in that case, it can't, I can't, if, if there is perjury and I wanted to report it to the police, I can't do that because I would go to jail 
for reporting it to the police. I think he suffered enough anyway, because really, you know, he shouldn't have started with the whole thing. It would never have come out if he hadn't started down the legal road, route. But you, perjury in secret courts generally goes undetected. There's a really, really big problem in the, in the family courts in England with, with expert evidence, where the experts at times talk complete nonsense. But because it's in secret, nothing happens about it. An important point is a judge can have little confidence that he or she has seen the evidence in full. So the judge doesn't get the full saga. Um, constraints on freedom of speech are very dangerous indeed because they lead to abuses of people and all sorts of things. We're talking here about narrow constraints, not the issue about publication and advertising of things, but narrow constraints on freedom of speech are very dangerous in their effects. And there are other cases, um, but I, I, I thought these give reasonable examples of things. Uh, the threat of prison has a chilling effect on media coverage. Well, it does, because I often can't get things reported because they just don't want to try. Although, obviously, parliamentary privilege does assist in these things. and that, that, But you, you get into a situation. We have, a, in my view, a very big problem in England where spurious reasons are taken to take children into care. And you often find that there's a process of taking babies off poor people and giving them to middle-class people for adoption, um, which is driven by a the secrecy of the system. So reasons, one mother had a, was deemed to be a bad mother because she put her baby on a mat with another baby, all right? And therefore she failed the parenting assessment because it was dangerous to have a baby next to a baby, all right? I know, I, I did all of this in the Education Select Committee. Um, and so she, she, um, she um, had her 10th child removed for that reason. And there were other ones removed for different reasons. Um, she's had an 11th one, but she's gone to live somewhere else in England, and now she's just been let go, let go home with the child. So there's a, there's a nice outcome for her, in a sense, but you've got 10 children now who've been, in my view, wrongly removed from their mother. Um, but there are lots of cases in England where you get many, many children, like you get mothers who have 15 babies removed on the trot, um, and it, it, it all happens in secret with unreliable evidence. Uh, but the threat of prison has a chilling effect on media coverage. Come back to that point. The editor will take a risk on defamation up to a point, but not on the editor going to jail. If there was a journalist going to jail, the editor wouldn't really mind. But if it's actually the editor who's on risk, or the publisher, or whatever it is, it, it gets, it's a much broader effect. It's this point about criminal defamation, defamation as well. Um, we shouldn't be complacent. The UK has, well, ever since the 1880s, when the Irish independence basically disrupted Parliament massively. We've developed a very weak parliamentary structure. That's been restructured with, under the right committee reforms, which I can talk about again for hours. Um, but we have had a weak Parliament, much, whereas in America it's a much stronger sort of parliamentary structure with the, um, the Senate and the um, House of Representatives there. Ours tends to be weak. It tends to focus on the government. Secret counts and courts are not accountable. For, for judicial processes to be properly accountable, you need to see what's going on. You can't have it all happening in secret. And we need more scrutiny, which at the moment can only really be done through Parliament. And you know, I, I think wider pu public discussion is, is important. There may be arguments at times for anonymity. That's a different argument. But we do need, people need to know what's going on. Um, but an anonymity itself risks that you separate things out. You make allegations against people. Like there are, there are people who are alleged to not have the mental capacity to do things. Um, and it's quite clear that they do. <laughs> I get emails from them. <laughs> So their, their, their legal rights are, I got one yes, no, this morning. Um, their legal rights are completely removed from them, and then somebody called the official solicitors appointed to take decisions on their behalf. Um, and um, in practice, they do understand what's going on. It's no issue. Some are actually above average IQ. Um, the interesting thing is there was a blog written recently by, I think it's the Human Rights Commission, something to do with the European Court of Human Rights Council of Europe, where the argument was that you shouldn't really do this. You shouldn't... Yeah, if somebody's in, in a coma, fair enough, they haven't got the mental capacity to do anything. But if somebody isn't in a coma, you should be very careful before you remove their rights to say what their lawyers should do, their right to instruct a lawyer. I was shocked when I found out this went on, and that was... I found this out when I was about 47, so... You know, and I've lived all my life in England. I didn't know that the... the, the and I, then I was even more shocked to see what um, evidence there was. And if you look up Niebert's website, you'll see an example of somebody who's complaining about having his rights removed. <laughs> and he's produced a website about how uh, Niebert, N-W-E-B-E-R-T, uh, Anthony Barker's his name. Um, but anyway, so, so I think that covers through those. Um, who benefits from secrecy? Well, the economically powerful and the politically powerful, all right? 
Openness protects the vulnerable. So there was, there was a, another cruise story, which was a Welsh one in the Court of Protection, where a local authority, there was a, there was a married couple where the, the wife had Alzheimer's and so she was in a home. Um, and the um, local authority, the, the, the husband wanted to take her on a cruise and the local council said that's too risky because she might jump in the sea. Well, I suppose that a, it is true, potentially, there's a risk that people can jump in the sea, but that happens whether or not they've got Alzheimer's. Um, and they went to court and had a big argument in court trying to stop him take his wife on a cruise. Um, now, that sort of, sort of stuff can all happen in secret. And I, I think it, it protects the vulnerable for people to be accountable and explain what's going on. All right. Some of these things aren't in the public domain, but, the, but, but you'll be all right. There's nothing in what I've said that uh, is, as far as I know, subject to reporting restrictions in the way I've said it. Yeah? Well, no, I, I've... Yeah. Thank you, John. All right. Do sit down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where to start. Such no. a plethora of information, well, there, it's, you know, it's fascinating sort of like, stories, insights, and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah it, it, the thing is, there's, there's, there's a lot going on, but, but because it, of the reporting restrictions, it goes unreported, and because people don't... The legal advice is expensive to work out what you can say and what you can't say. And it's also because a lot of it's going wrong in the judicial estate of the Constitution. There's a sort of nervousness there, and actually, one of the things, one thing that has had a chilling effect on the, the media is, is the Leveson inquiry, where everyone's a bit nervous about where this is going. Absolutely. Um, let, me ask you, let, let me ask you a, 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 a general question, and then a specific question, and then open up the debate. The general question is this, and you, you, you gave, you touched on an answer to this. You gave us a whole plethora of examples of restrictions on uh, freedom of expression, mm. on reporting rights and what have you, incursions on those rights. Uh, and the question that I'm sure an awful lot of people have got, because the UK is a, is a very lively democracy nevertheless, uh, when one sees all these examples that you're quoting, then one asks oneself, who are, the, uh, who are the vested interests, or what are the vested interests, that allow it to be thus? Well, it's and money. You, you, you touched on it. It's money. We need, to, we need to hear more. There's money. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not, you know, if you've got access to a lot of money, you can pay for the legal costs of keeping things secret. And you can do it in such a way as people don't want to report it. Because you know, most media organizations are commercial organizations. They've got to make a profit. Um, you can only go so far fighting these things. If you look at some of the privacy cases which are being taken to appeal, there's a certain point at which the newspaper would say it's just not worth the money. It's not worth actually contesting it in court because if we contest it in court and we pay the other side's costs, that's £250,000. The story's not worth that. The problem with it is some of them are trivial issues uh, that really it doesn't matter either way, and some are very serious issues, ab abuses and oppression of people. Um, I didn't mention the fact that we get journalists banned from the UK. I've got one dealing with one case of a journalist from America, Leah Goodman, who's been banned from coming to the UK. You mentioned the because she wants to investigate what's going on in Jersey, by the way. So you mentioned the weakness of uh, of, of the of the British Parliament. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's a question of the the, the, the strength. Of what happened was that the government was given control over the parliamentary agenda, and the Parliament then focused on the government and just let the judiciary wander off on their own. And the judiciary are supposed to be held to account by everybody. Obviously, Parliament doesn't go around changing decisions, but that's a different issue. Um, you, talk, you talked about uh, the, w w the, the whole Ryan Giggs uh, episode, mm. yeah? And Clive Myrie, who was here on Tuesday, he talked about that and he said he, uh, Ryan Giggs was exposed through Twitter initially, through the Scottish media, through a certain politician, through Forbes. In, uh, yeah, through a Forbes certain Wednesday. politician in yeah. Parliament who named Ryan Giggs. Yeah, at yeah. the point at which 24 million, at least, or 23 million, knew that, what his name was. Okay, so it wasn't, many, it wasn't many, a confidential issue then. Many people agreed that that was right and good. Mm. Yeah, Clive Myrie asked the question on Tuesday: What about Ryan Giggs's wife? She had no protection against exposure. Well, the the the, the wider issue is one of this is where you come down to the question of how you handle privacy issues. All right, and you know, I, the, the thing is, I've been through quite a bit in terms of private exposure of my, you know, my wife stealing my girlfriend's kitten, for instance. That's been over the international media. Uh, <laughs> well, it has, hasn't it? Has it? <laughs> Are people aware of the story? Yeah. Who's aware of that story? 
So how many hands up? We've That's got about, about four five. hands, yeah. Well, that's not bad in a Berlin audience, is it? Do you want to sketch the story in two No, I don't. I've just told you it. It's, <laughs> it's a sentence, isn't it? But it, it's on the internet in various places. Um, but the, 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 I think there, there are, I could go on for hours and hours and hours about this. The problem is you've got other people to speak later and I need to catch a plane, although I'm not in a rush at the moment. So. It's not my time. Well, well, let me put it like this. In that story, journalists invaded your private life and the private life of your wife, uh, but they weren't really journalists. They were scandal mongers. mongers. Well, it's, but they were reporting a, a judicial process, and they've reported it pretty well entirely properly. Where's the difficulty? I have no difficulty, but it was your private life that was invaded. Well, it wasn't invaded, mm -hmm. um, but I just like, where's the problem? I'm sorry, you know, it's, if, you, if you don't want it on the front page of the newspaper, don't do it. What's where, wrong with that? Uh, yeah, well, the question I'm really asking is where in the modern world of Twitter and new media and what have you... Uh, well, what, in the what, old what world, actually, in America, where, where, where would there be the constraints on reporting? I do believe in some constraints on reporting. I accept. That's the question. That's the question. I do where believe in some constraints on reporting. So the subjudice parts for contempt of court, that if you... And this is where I have sympathy with uh, Chris, Chris Jesford, was his name, down in Bristol, who was basically tried and found guilty in the media of a crime he didn't commit. And the, the problem with that is you can then uh, prejudice a court hearing. And th this is where you go back to the Turkish stuff you were talking about, that there are circumstances where people should not publish and advertise things. That's, that's a different thing to something being public and talked about. So there are those different thresholds. And I, I'm not saying there should never be any constraints on, on reporting. That's one I'm quite supportive of. And obviously, you want people to tell the truth. That's the, I mean, the problem we have is that reporting starts in the, in the Ryan Giggs case. That what, what's called reporting started on Twitter, which is well, an actual fact, rumor, and at some stage becomes reporting. It crosses a threshold. Well, it, it, this is this. You go back to this question of um, spycatcher, which was uh, where there was um, I can't remember his name, but there was a, a work, somebody who worked for the security services published in Australia his um, memoirs, and it was thought therefore. Once it was published, it was in the public domain and therefore not subject to a, any confidentiality. Um, there, with the Ryan Giggs, the interesting question would be at what point would it have been deemed to be non-confidential information? Uh, probably actually a couple of weeks before I mentioned it in Parliament. The point at which the, the crowd at Manchester United were chanting it about three weeks before, I think was probably at the point you'd say this is not confidential information. All right. Um, but but I, my view on privacy is actually it's how people obtain information that's more important the than the methods used to obtain information where constraints should be there, um, rather than necessarily that information that is reported. So I, you know, I don't think people should hack phones. Um, I think there is, you also have a great difficulty as to um, how you can argue a public interest defense to breaking the law, all right? So harassing people, turning up in a massive crowd and camping outside their house is not about reporting. That, that's, that's about harassing people. Now, yes, you perhaps put, need to put a bit of effort into people as they're walking around sometimes, but I, think the, the, I don't think there's a right to harass people, uh, and that's the invasion. It's not the reporting that's the invasion. It's the way in which information is obtained and how, how pressure is put on people. Mm. And that, that, those, those, I think, are more the areas. But, I, you know, if you, if, there is a danger in having a society where you have too many secrets because the, everything becomes based on things that are not true and you, you can't trust what, what people are saying. And then that gets to be a mess. Um, revealing that, there were, that there's been a police cover-up about an investigation about a murdering nurse on his web blog. I didn't put that one on there. But he was, he was very bad for my liver, because every night he'd buy a bottle of red wine and then we'd drink it. And that was very bad. We have another question for the yeah. Hi, my name is Josh Wolf. I'm a reporter in the United States, and I'm completely surprised at all the stuff you had to say. Yeah. And it immediately caused me to pull up the uh, Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index to see where the UK sat yeah. in comparison to the United States. And, for those that might not know, you're 28th and we're 47th. But when I hear what you're saying, I about, think you're probably better. Yeah. It, it feels to me like we're we'd be better for press freedoms. I'm curious. I think you're probably right. But you see, because it doesn't get reported, it doesn't. The restraints don't get reported either. 
And this is, this is the strength. We go back to the sanctions thing. If you threaten people with imprisonment, if you threaten the editor or the proprietor with imprisonment, it's, it, or, you know, it's, it's a much stronger sanction than um, you know, a defamation case. And obviously, US defamation is a different burden of proof, which, I don't know, I'm, I'd sort of take to, I think the, the issue about libel tourism, which is an interesting question, I think that may be, it's been dealt with in America, I think quite rightly so as well, that America won't enforce British court orders for defamation. Uh, I think that's right, because they'd go over the top. Um, and I do expect the defamation laws to be changed in England at some stage, but I don't think they'd be changed to be like the American ones. Because I, I do think it's a good idea for people to prove that what they say is true. No, I don't, you know, but it's, it's, it's a... <laughs> okay, maybe one, one last question. I have, I have a, a very personal comment after this. But... Right. Yeah, just, uh, just one question about the uh, defamation laws. Actually, uh, two aspects and a uh, comparison between the uh, UK and the US. Uh, one is, uh, in the US, there's a delineation between public figures and uh, not so public yeah. figures. And uh, basically, there, there's you know, a, a higher burden uh, in the case of public figures. You have to prove malicious intent and uh, just it has to be totally at odds with the facts. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, uh, is jurisdiction. Uh, if, uh, and, and specifically, if something is published on the internet, I mean, there's no control over where, where the person uh, who's publishing it is. So my question is, uh, uh, if something libelous is published about something in the UK and somebody somewhere else in the world, are the libel laws enforceable? Or, or, or not are they enforceable, but can, uh, are they Well, actionable? they do, but it, it, this is the point. They do, they, they, they've been a sort of slight rowing back from where it was. But the, the, this is the point about libel tourism, that people have been suing on websites in the English courts. There was one really weird one involving, I think, things in Croatia or something like that, where I've got the papers on, I have to look it up. Uh, but there was a very weird case where there was such a tenuous link to the UK, yet they were using the UK courts. But there's another issue in, 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 in the UK, costs follow the action. So the, 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 win, the winner of a case gets his or her costs paid by the loser of the case. In the USA, I don't think that's the case. I think you pay each, other, each side pays their own costs. Um, that's an interesting question as to what effect that has on, on legal processes because the, the, what, a lot of legal cases in England are settled by costs bullying. So people are, can't take the risk of fighting the case because they have to be incredibly strong or very poor. Yeah, but that's, you know, if, they ha if they're of average means, you, if you look at a lot of these injunctions where men are using an injunction to gag their ex-girlfriend, the ex-girlfriend doesn't have, probably has enough money to pay some of the costs, but can't afford to fight the action because if they lose, and you can never be sure which way it's going to go 100%, um, they pay the costs. So th there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of questions about costs. Just a personal note from here in Berlin and from knowing lots of German journalists, uh, they often find themselves being mocked by Anglo-Saxon journalists who come to Germany and say, look, you guys have got no tradition of investigative journalism. And they point to the fact that the words for investigative journalism in the German language are investigative journalismus, which is yeah. in, in fact the English term just translated straight into the yeah. German language, which does seem to reveal that there isn't a great tradition. What's happened to that tradition then of investigative journalism? Have British journalists become I think puny? Have they been cowed? I think there is an issue about people trying to produce too many column inches in too short a period of time. Investigative journalism, there's much less of it going on, right? Um, investigative journalism takes time, and you can't guarantee that you're going to get a result. So there are easier stories to write that, that, that you can produce column inches, but they don't really matter that much. Obviously, there's still the work being done. Christopher Booker, for instance, because, because he's known to be so concerned about the family courts, a lot of people tell him the stories. So he gets the stories coming to him. Uh, and other people have done it, but sometimes, you see, it takes Sue Reed. She's a brilliant journalist. She used to get lots of care stories, but the newspaper decided that she was doing too many and therefore changed it. Um, and uh, 
the, there's, there's those things going on. But I, I think they, I, I, I actually think that it's got partly because of the issue of deadlines, right? So deadlines are tighter. Um, and that's the, partly the internet, but all sorts of other things. Partly money, partly everything. And there's, there, there is less investigative journalism being done. I think that's true. Um, but there is still some being done. And there's lots of good journalists. It's not that there aren't good journalists. Um, but I think the pressures on people to perform in terms of the amount of material they produce are, are such that it's got more quality, more quantity, but less quality. Absolutely the same uh, case here in Germany. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a technological shift. A lot of things are technological shifts, and they therefore happen in similar countries around the world in a similar manner. Um, but then you see this is where you have this crossover, and there, there are... I know people like Xaro are trying this, but they're not really doing it. They're, they're playing the same game, actually. I will say, uh, John Hemming, thank you very much for being so very entertaining. All right. And, uh, All right. Very Cheers. great stuff. Thank All you. Right. Thank you.